Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the School of Public Policy's post US election panel discussion. My name is Deborah Yellen, and I'm the Chancellor of the University of Calgary. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, and that the city of Calgary is also home to Maine Nation of Alberta, Region 3. I'm very pleased to be here today to moderate this panel discussion, which is part of a broader series hosted by the School of Public Policy about the US election. It's been a wild ride these last 48 hours, and there is so much to talk about. As a self-confessed political junkie, I'm very excited to hear from this incredible group of panelists about what is going on south of the border and what the impact could be on Canada when we do get some clarity on who will be in the White House and what the makeup of the House and Senate will be. I'm sure I'm not the only one who is hoping the uncertainty is soon resolved and that we can all get a little more sleep. We'll be taking audience questions at the end, so please feel free to submit those via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we're, I'm gonna get started right away uh, by introducing our panel members. First up, Dr. Monica, Monica Gattinger. She wears many hats at the University of Ottawa including Director of the Institute for Science, Society and Policy, as well as being the Chair of Positive Energy and a Professor in the School of Political Science. Next, we have Frank Graves, who is President of ECOS Research Associates, and for sure we'll have some commentary on polling. Colin Robertson is Vice President and Fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, an Executive Fellow with the School of Public Policy, and a Distinguished Senior Fellow with the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. And finally, a welcome to Dr. Christopher Sands, who is the director of the Canada Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC, and a senior research professor in Canadian studies with the Paul Neitz School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you for being here today and sharing your perspectives. I suspect an hour will not be anywhere near enough. So as I said, it's been a wild 48 hours is what we have witnessed, what you expected, despite the predictions of a blue wave. I'm gonna start with Frank and then I'll ask Chris to, to, to follow up once Frank's had a time to say a few words. Thank you, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And it has been a wild ride, which apparently is not over yet. No. Uh, we put out a piece recently based on some polling we did in the United States called the Trump Paradox. And we marveled at the fact that on any number of indicators, uh, such as trust in government, which had just hit a 65 year low, or handling of the pandemic or approval of the performance of the government, that this should be a no brainer. This should be an election which would look like our Canadian 1993 election where the majority was reduced to three seats. But in fact, we, we noted at the time, it was still very difficult to call. And the, the main reason for that is I think the level of intense polarization which has occurred in the United States, which we actually measured and found it's deep and deep from 2016. And we, this produced this Trump paradox where you would have thought this would have been just a walk in the park for the Democrats. And yet here we are, you know, still unable to anoint a winner uh, after, after uh, two days. So it's, uh, it's really been, it's really remarkable. And I think whatever the result, it's going to leave behind in, 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 a polarized and intensely divided America, which is going to uh, have a, a, a formidable set of problems, which will obviously influence us as the northern neighbor watching all this. And we've been watching this with incredible interest. Uh, as 79% of Canadians tell me they're, they're worried that the United States is on the verge of chaos. Uh, a similar number tell, tell us to expressing their sympathies with uh, the Democrats that they think without a regime change, things are only gonna get worse. So yeah, we're, we've all been riveted uh, and coming in the context of what has been a once in a lifetime historic collision of economic and health risks with the pandemic, this, is, this has just made it even more uh, complex and important. Chris, is this what uh, you're uh, Yes and no. Uh, so <laughs> that's a wishy-washy answer, but let me, let me explain that slightly. So yes, 
because ever since the 2000 election between George W. Bush and Al Gore, the political parties organized themselves to be ready to challenge election results. And because we don't have centralized election administration, actually every state and territory and often individual counties are doing their own administration. The reason that you have to have all these lawyers is to challenge the process. And for those of you who know the US well, we have this kind of approach to law where we pass laws and then we litigate them out to find out what they really mean, all the way up to the Supreme Court. It's a strange part of the American way. I, I don't know how to explain it, but I always expected there to be a contest uh, going after the election. It, it's just become the ritual. And if you remember the 2012 election where Barack Obama beat Mitt Romney, a lot of Republicans criticized Romney for, for conceding too soon. And in 2016, a lot of Democrats criticized Hillary Clinton for conceding too soon. And I think that goes to why neither candidate has been willing to give up until they've really had a chance to work this through. So that I expected. The other part, which I think has been interesting, and, and so the US is going through something that will happen from time to time, which is a, a sort of change in the bases of the two main parties. The two US political parties, we, we don't have an NDP or a Bloc Québécois or, or multiple parties to, to splinter opinion. We have two parties that are big tents. People move in and out of those coalitions and the coalitions themselves, other than the brand name, are capable of moving all the time. And what we're used to is a sense, well, we know what a Republican is, we know what a Democrat is. We know that because they've been stable for a long time and that they've been stable for a long time because of the baby boomers, the dominant cohort in the US electorate up until recently. They knew what they thought the Republican party should be about, free trade, strong defense, uh, socially conservative values and low taxes. And we knew what the Democrats were about, uh, concern for minority groups, the disadvantaged social program spending, labor unions, and occasionally protectionism. But that kind of mix was stable until now. We started to see now the millennial generation become the largest cohort in the electorate. And we have some data on the millennials, but they view politics differently. Their approach is a little less ideological. It's still a little bit idealistic. They're a young generation and they're inheriting this entire mess. And so what's been happening in the last couple of years, and we can talk about this later, is Parties have been trying to market themselves to this new generation while not losing their old generation. And Donald Trump came on the scene in 2016 with an idea for the Republicans, which were probably the weaker of the two parties. And that is we could become a populist nationalist party, socially conservative, patriotic, uh, and at the same time, working for blue collar workers and drawing and being protectionist if, as necessary. That has built him a base. And if 2016, you might think, well, that was a fluke. He showed that his base, not enough to win, but his base would, would follow him still. And I think this election consolidates his hold on the Republican Party. And the Democrats, on the other hand, are still trying to figure out who they are. And the challenge of this next four years will be Joe Biden, a leader of the old party, a man of the center, a traditional Democrat, leading a party full of youthful, idealistic folks who want action on climate change, race relations, and so many other issues. It's, uh, it obviously has implications for Canada as well. So what's at stake uh, for Canada in terms of the outcome of the election? I'm going to ask Colin to start and Monica to, to follow up. Well, thanks, Deborah. For Canada, the most important relationship we have is that with the United States. It's both our shield in terms of defense, but also the source of our prosperity because it's the biggest market in the world and we have preferred access to that market something we had to fight quite hard. And you're certainly aware of over the last three years as we renegotiated the NAFTA and came up with the Canada-US-Mexico agreement from a starting point of Donald Trump saying he was gonna repeal the NAFTA. So for us, it is the relationship and then there's all the rest. And of course it starts at the top. The most important relationship for any prime minister is that with the president of the United States. And as we know, we went from the bromance that Justin Trudeau enjoyed with Barack Obama to pretty difficult relationship with Donald Trump. Every Democratic leader had a difficult relationship with Donald Trump. I think Trudeau made the best he could, but it will certainly get a lot easier with Joe Biden, who in one of his last visits as vice president to Barack Obama came to Canada in December 2016 after the election, Donald Trump, and said to Justin Trudeau publicly, to you, the uh, torch of 
the rules-based order is passed. I expect you and Angela Merkel to carry this for the next four years or so. So four years fast forward, and we're likely to have a, a Biden administration. That's going to make life much easier for Canada in terms of dealing with the United States. But I think importantly, Deborah, it also brings greater stability back to a rules-based international system that we also depend upon because the United States, and particularly the United States president, has been the guarantor of that system that was created by an American president and sustained by every American president, Democrat or Republican, until Donald Trump, who really didn't care and made a point of saying, I'm not a multilateralist and not an internationalist. And for Canada, those are the two pillars of our continuing foreign policy, internationalism and multilateralism. Monica. Great, uh, thanks. Thanks, Deborah. And I think, you know, I'm gonna zero my remarks in more on the energy and environmental space. Um, so I think, you know, on the one hand, there's an awful lot at stake for Canada. But on the other hand, um, many of the issues that Canada faces on energy and, and environment are actually more domestic than they are um, bilateral. Um, so, you know, one observation I would make is that since about 2000, Canada-U.S. energy relations have died a slow, quiet death. We went from a very robust uh, federal government to federal government set of relationships uh, under former Prime Minister uh, Chrétien and former President Bush with the North American Energy Working Group, which then morphed into the Security and Prosperity Partnership. You know, we were talking at that time about things like a shared North American natural gas vision. I mean, that, nothing could be further from where we're at right now in terms of um, the robustness of discussions around, uh, around energy. So what changed? Well, um, we know uh, the shale revolution uh, transformed North American energy markets. So, you know, back in 2000, the big issue was about energy security. Now we have a U.S. that's gone from hydrocarbon scarcity uh, to hydrocarbon uh, abundance and become the largest oil and gas producer in the world. So that's had an impact, um, understandably, on Canada-U.S. energy relations, not only uh, in oil and gas. I mean, in gas, we've seen we've been kind of pushed out of uh, uh, U.S. markets and oil. Uh, we're still very strong in U.S. markets, but we know we've got uh, challenges on pricing and, and access. Uh, but even in electricity, there's been some reductions there uh, in recent years as a result of um, fuel switching in the power uh, sector. So, you know, we've really gone to this, gotten to this place on energy and, and climate where um, it's very much an ad hoc uh, relationship that has tended to be sort of bundled up into Keystone XL and Keystone XL alone, which I can understand for a whole host of reasons, but it does leave a lot of other things on the table. Uh, and this is where I would end. I think a Biden administration, if we do, do go in the direction of a Biden administration, it could actually change things uh, fairly substantially. I mean, this is an administration that has said, you know, job one will be coming back into the Paris Agreement. Um, there are commitments there around 100% clean uh, energy. By that, they actually do mean oil and gas being included, uh, it being included in the mix. So there could be some opportunities there for Canada uh, in terms of working with the United States on things like CCUS, electricity, potentially even in the context of Paris, uh, Article 6 negotiations. So that's an interesting point because, you know, as of yesterday, the U.S. did leave the Paris Accords. And Joe Biden has talked about a $2 trillion spend on renewable uh, energy and climate change initiatives. He does not look like he's, if he does, if, if he does succeed with this, this uh, the election, he doesn't have control of the Senate. So where does that leave his climate initiatives and his uh, intentions on this file? I'm curious because I think it also goes back to what Christopher talked about uh, and the polarization and the millennials. And so, you know, the younger generation wants to see this move forward, but uh, he's going to have the Senate that he's going to have to deal with that may not be so interested in advancing it. So I think I'm going to throw this to, to Chris and then we can go to Colin and whoever else would like to, uh, to weigh in after that. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Deborah. I, I think I think that's the part of the story that's starting to fill itself in now, which is the composition of Congress. And it'll be so crucial. For my money, the worst case scenario for Joe Biden would be a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate. 
And the reason I say that is because there'll be a lot of pressure on him to act. Expectations are high, but it's still going to be difficult to do things. If you look at Bill Clinton in 1992, he came in with Democratic control of the House and Senate. And those first two years were some of his least productive. People who were in the same party wanted to trade their vote for something, and, uh, and there was a lot of room to maneuver. Once the Republicans took the House, lots more got done, ironically. Uh, similarly for Barack Obama, he came in with a Democratic House and Senate, and he struggled those first two years trying to deal with the global financial crisis and trying to move health care basically the only two big things he was able to get done because he had to do so much work to keep Congress together. But once the Republicans came into the game, he had someone to negotiate with, but also someone to take the blame when he had to disappoint people who really wanted action fast. So for Joe Biden, if this current situation holds and the Senate remains in Republican hands, even if it's barely, that'll give him a foil. And I think that'll help him to buy some time there's also something that I think is easily missed with all of the polarization and shouting going on. It looks like a disaster, but there are some considerable areas of bipartisan consensus underneath the surface. And I wrote a piece for policy options about this that came out this morning. So I won't bore you with reading my piece, but I'll just point to a couple of them. The USMCA, big bipartisan majorities on both sides supporting that agreement. Uh, that clearly has Republican and Democratic support and indicates that trade policy, one that is a little protectionist of our declining industries, but also supports market access elsewhere, is possible, even in a divided Washington. Similarly, the CARES Act, which was passed to provide stimulus and research money to address COVID. Now, it was $2 trillion the first round. We weren't able to get a second bill, but you can build bipartisan majorities around trying to re respond to COVID. And I actually think climate change may be another area. Um, and the reason I say that is I think less about Washington, more about the world. One of the complaints that many Americans had had about past climate agreements, including Paris, but also Kyoto, going back to the uh, Bush administration's walking away, was that the U.S. and European countries and Canada were making the big cuts. We had to do the painful adjustment, while big developing countries, who are also big emitters, India, China, Brazil, others, sat on the sidelines and waited. We had to hit a threshold, and they argued with us, look, you guys got rich destroying the planet, so now we want to catch up and get rich. You guys can take the cuts for now. I think that was a politically difficult position. You, you can understand the logic, but a lot of ordinary citizens didn't like it. Now, given the advances in technology, how much China and India are already doing on this and Brazil as well, there's a much greater potential for us to, kind, to have a, a mutual attack on carbon and, and addressing climate change together. Now, it'll be slower than we want. A lot of the developing countries are economically hard hit by COVID too. But I think the potential is here for a much more constructive dialogue on climate. And I think that given the rise of the millennials and, and a much broader base of support and the need for trade-offs, I think that could advance. I'm gonna just second, I wanna make sure we get back to the millennial uh, issue. And I wanna to get to Frank first to call in on this issue, uh, this question. Well, I'm not as optimistic as Chris. I think that the next two years are gonna be gridlock again. I think mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell is gonna do exactly what he did to Barack Obama and uh, not let anything get through. I think the only piece of legislation that might get through will be uh, the Build Back Better big infrastructure program because I think it's something that both Democrats and Republicans agree upon. I certainly don't think we're going to see any environmental legislation pass. It will get blocked in the Senate. And so I think Biden is not going to proceed with it. I'm not as, uh, as pessimistic about first two years. I realize the first year any administration has to staff and that's going to be a challenge because again, a lot of it will have to be approved by the, the Senate confirmations for the senior appointments. And again, I don't expect any favors from Mitch McConnell. Um, one thing this election did illustrate was that Trumpism, Trump may go, but Trumpism is certainly alive and well, and they're already building the narrative for next time about the stolen election. The next election is two years away. So I think that no to anything on climate, because it simply won't get through the Senate. I think the opportunities in this, brings it back to Canada, maybe on big infrastructure where we're going to have to get down there and make the case so that neither Republicans or Democrats, both have become more protectionist, don't apply by American provisions. We're going to have to make the case as to why it should be by North American and why there are opportunities for both of us to work together for a more competitive North America. But that's going to be a bit of a lift and it's going to be certainly where Canada is going to have to put its energies. 
So yeah, Frank, you know, you, Chris has mentioned this, this the, the, the influence of the, of, of the millennials in this election, and it's only going to continue to grow. You know, the midterm elections, we're going to see that voice continue to, to, to get louder. How does uh, uh, President Biden or Trump, um, if, he, if he actually sweeps through, balance that voice, which does want to address racial inequality, uh, does want progress on climate change? Uh, where does that leave uh, the whole, uh, you know, the whole, the landscape in the U.S., given who will be sitting in the White House potentially? Well, not, not to discount the obvious importance of the, the fact that the millennials are now the largest voting cohort in the United States. I actually think that, and it does link to, but I think the big divide and the source of polarization, which has been going on now and developing for the last 20, 30 years, but has really exploded over the last five years, is this shift from a traditional left-right dispute about the future to this open-ordered or authoritarian versus open outlook. And that transcends uh, a lot of, uh, it cuts across generation to some extent, but it's driven more by the simple fact that you have a very large group of angry and frightened parts of the citizenry that feel whatever's been going on for the last 20, 30 years simply isn't working for them. They feel a sense of economic despair, which mutates into hostility to outgroups, deep suspicion of institutions. And that I think is what Donald Trump successfully tapped into and I think it's become an even stronger force while he's been in office. So I think that's going to be a daunting challenge and one that you probably have to go back to the original forces which put this in place. If we look at the United States and Canada falls in lockstep on this, at the opening of the 20th century, 70% of Americans located themselves as members of the middle class. Uh, most of them thought yeah, that was the bargain where they worked hard, uh, they do better than their parents, their kids would do better than them and so on. That number has fallen to 45% in the United States and a similar number in Canada. In other words, 60 million Americans have fallen out of the middle class, mostly into the working class, some into the poor. They do not feel any sense of optimism about the future. And bromides about, yeah, we're the United States and we need to work together and we need to recover, you know, bipartisan, which are all healthy antidotes, really don't speak to the source problem, which has been rooted in things like the hyper-concentration of wealth, which is accompanied by a cultural backlash where those who felt left behind thought that the core values they believed in uh, are, are no longer applicable, uh, respect for authority, you know, strong family values and so forth. So dealing with those you know, primordial kind of divisions which have produced two Americas is I think uh, the challenge which if you, this is simply not gonna go away. And if anything, it's been exacerbated by the pandemic, I believe. So I, I, I have a less cheerful outlook on the prospects because that that is an incredibly difficult problem. How different is this from let's say the upheaval, the social upheaval that we saw in the late 1960s? Well it, it's quite different, it, 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 it's similar, I don't think it's, a, I think this is an even more powerful, but it's similar in a sense it's rejection, uh, you know, countercultural rejection. But if you think about the traditional de uh, uh, Republican Party members, say at the beginning of the century or going back to the, even the Reagan era, they were, you know, suburban, college educated, believed in small government, you know, indiv rugged individualism. That's got nothing to do, or very, very little to do with the current expressions of let's pull up the drawbridge, let's turn back the clock, let's make America great again. Overwhelming concentration of support in working class, not the middle class. Uh, it, it's psychographically, demographically, a very, very different mix. And what's happened is, it's the same people, more or less, as some talking about older and there's young people come along, but it's been a tremendous amount of sorting so that a lot of these groups that previously would have been found across the spectrum are now united in a way that they have far more emotional engagement and that makes it a much more difficult problem to resolve or to, to produce some sort of consensual position. Chris, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Thank you, uh, slow on the trigger finger there. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I am the optimist here, and I say that from the heart of the swamp, so maybe it's the swamp gas getting to me, but, um, but I, I, think, I think that one of the things we've seen, and there have been a couple of studies, there's one out from the Cato Institute, there's another that's been done by what, some of the other think tanks, and, and the Pew Charitable Trust has done some interesting work as well, and what they've been looking at is that millennials are a little bit less ideological. It, it's bad to make historical analogies, but I, I could see maybe two paths the millennials could take. 
if they're like the generation that came after World War I and the Spanish flu pandemic, that generation, we call them the lost generation. They came out of that experience feeling that the leaders of the world uh, had basically used them for cannon fodder and messed everything up. They were cynical. They were bitter. They didn't really focus on politics. They focused instead on trying to make the most of the life they had. We got the roaring 20s and minimalist government in the U.S., but it wasn't necessarily a happy time, and their influence on policy was pretty minor. That's a possibility here, given the mess that people have made of the world. I could see a lot of millennials having that attitude, very consistent with the picture that Frank put forward. But the other possibility is that they would be a little bit more like the the greatest generation, the one that followed World War II and the Great Depression. That generation looked at the world, especially World War II, and said, we've had it with ideology. Fascism, communism, all that does is get people killed. And they wanted a hue to the center, pulled together, pragmatic politics. They didn't want to hear about ideology. American politics in the 40s and 50s, extremely boring. But things got done. And I could also see millennials expressing a frustration with the arguments of the past, you know, decades and wanting action. And action sometimes means compromise. So I'm hopeful that this generation will, will be thinking along those lines, particularly as their idealism from being naturally young is tempered by the fact that they have kids, that they had a mortgage to their student loan debt, and they're trying to sort of navigate a way forward. I have to say, and I don't, it's a pox in everybody's houses. It's not a partisan comment, but I think that some of the high expectations that previous administrations have given us have really come to nothing. So maybe we could do with a little bit more modest expectations, be a bit more Canadian in our attitude about the world uh, and being sort of more modest. Um, but we may be forced to that by the tough conditions. And I could see young people finding that very appealing. Colin? Well, I think that you, I'd want to see more data. Uh, you know, the, big, the boomer generation, there's all sorts of variations there between class and color. Uh, and I think the same will apply to the millennials. I think it's very sometimes a bit slippery to sort of assume a new generation has a certain day fix. I think the, the, the greatest generation were different because they had one seminal marking event, and that was World War for five years, and the, the whole economy was shifted. I think the millennials, you know, what, certainly what I see, but I would defer to Frank, you see different, I think class matters. I think uh, ethnic background matters as much as your age cohort. So the E-Day fix, as you just called it, for the millennial, really, many of the millennial generation is climate and climate change. And one of the uh, things that we've been focused on in the last 48 hours is what happens to the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, Monica, what, uh, what do you think that the future of that project holds under Biden? Um, is there a bipartisan solution? Uh, or does it get uh, put on the back burner again? Well, this is a project, as, as we know, that uh, has known all sorts of uh, on again and off again, and, and not only at the presidential level, but also at the state uh, at the state level as well. So, um, you know, certainly uh, where a U.S. president stands on it is 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 one matter, even with uh, a president who fully supported it. We see that four years later, uh, we're still waiting on, uh, uh, you know, waiting on various portions of, uh, of that pipeline. It's difficult to imagine, I must admit, sadly, under a democratic uh, presidency, you know, this is a project that has become such a lightning rod and a political symbol uh, for the uh, climate action activist uh, crowd in, in the United States and for the Democratic Party. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's difficult to imagine, uh, um, uh, uh, particularly when Biden is on the record saying that uh, he would uh, reverse the presidential permit. Um, that said, I don't think it means that Canada should stop um, impressing upon the United States the importance of this project. And I think also making known to the United States some of the tremendous progress that's been made in the energy sector, notably uh, in, in oil and notably in the oil sands in terms of reducing emissions. Because you'll recall that much of the uh, opposition to Keystone XL has been around not only just the fact that it's carrying oil, but that it's carrying oil sands. Uh, oil. And I think that is a message that really needs to uh, get forward. And I know our governments are very sensitive, uh, sensitive to that and attuned to that. But it has to, you know, that's something that the Canadian governments 
federal and provincial are going to need to impress upon notably a Biden administration all of the tremendous gains that have been made in terms of emissions intensity, also in terms of uh, also in terms of cost. And I think, you know, I would also just add, this is an area too where, you know, if you think about both Canada and the United States, they're both large now, hydrocarbon uh, energy uh, producers, both of whom, particularly if it's a Biden administration in the United States, want to be active on climate change. And so they're increasingly going to be facing this same challenge, which is how do you act on climate change and how do you at the same time uh, support your uh, hydrocarbon uh, sector? And, you know, I would like to think that we could have a more inclusive conversation around that. And perhaps that broader topic might be one where a Biden administration, uh, you know, would be more open to uh, uh, being pragmatic and uh, uh, seeing things through a different lens, which again, potentially uh, could have an impact on the way in which the Keystone XL pipeline uh, is seen, but I think that's a very open question. What about the need for Canadian energy in light of the fact that U.S. production for the shale phase is, is, is going to be dropping? And well, and I think this gets back to the point I made before is that, you know, Canada's issues on energy uh, are, are, are many of which, many of them are domestic, right? So yes, there's access to uh, U.S. markets, but market access isn't just about access to the U.S. Uh, market, as we know, it's increasingly to markets beyond North America. Um, you know, this is the first time uh, in Canada's energy exporting history over the last decade or so that, uh, you know, the big play has been about trying to ensure we get oil and gas resources off of the North American continent. And that has meant, as we know, uh, a lot more contentiousness within Canada, right? Because these are now pieces of infrastructure that are flowing east-west as opposed to north, uh, as opposed to north-south. And there is not a lot of consensus in the country country around what is the country's energy future uh, in an age of climate change and notably where does oil and gas uh, sit uh, sit in that context. So Canada is a trading nation and you know we are very focused on our as you said the trade policy so broadly speaking so I guess the question to you is uh, to all of you I mean are there provinces better positioned to benefit from the new administration than others? Uh, what about key industries and how do we address um, the potential for arbitrary tariffs on certain industries that we've been dealing with in the last four years. Uh, curious to see what uh, everybody thinks about that. Maybe we'll start with that, Chris, and go to Colin. Um, sure, thank, thank you, Deborah. It's a good question because we, th we think so much about problems, we don't always think of the opportunities. Um, one big opportunity for Canada, and I think Colin touched on this, it was the USMCA. There were a lot of debates about whether that was, uh, you know, whether it was worth it to revise NAFTA. But not only having revised NAFTA and, and made some upgrades, particularly on digital trade and so on, but to have locked that in, I think it'd be very hard uh, and very hard to see a major trade agreement go through now. A lot of parts of the world really will face arbitrary tariffs and surprises uh, now. Joe Biden is a, is a Buy America guy, for, for, for example, has been for a long time. So there are risks. But I think Canada and Mexico have locked in pretty good access that will endure. I don't see it, I don't see it changing. We still have to implement it. I think that'll turn out to have been one of the best bets that Trudeau made. And he obviously took his lumps for it. But I think it really has put Canada in a very good position. Um, I would add to that, and, and maybe to address people before they object about aluminum 232 tariffs, but one of the interesting wrinkles in the um, USMCA are side letters that create a 60-day cooling off period before 232 tariffs, specifically the national security tariffs, can be applied. The idea is to let the data settle and give diplomacy a chance to avoid a crunch. The only reason that didn't kick in when Donald Trump snapped those aluminum tariffs back over the summer was because he was snapping back old tariffs under the old rules. But for, for future uh, administrations that try to hit Canada with 232s, there's now a process. So I think in some ways that cast some shade on the USMCA, it made it look like it wasn't working, but I think there are some protections in there that will stand Canada in a good stead. Colin? Well, I'd say protectionism is as American as apple pie and uh, you know, that I was when I was posted in Washington, that we were dealing with softwood lumber, and I remember Frank McKenna, who was the ambassador, said to me, "When did this all begin?" And I went back and I spoke to the Librarian of Congress, and he went back and came back and reported it goes back to the first George Washington administration, when the timber merchants of Massachusetts, which included Maine at the time, didn't like the the lumber, as we call it, coming into Massachusetts for shipbuilding. And so this is something that is deeply uh, in the American system. It reflects sort of structural 
problems within the United States, but protectionism is what traditionally Democrats have, have turned to, but now we're seeing Republicans do so. And I don't think that changes with uh, Joe Biden coming in, as Chris says, and Biden favors generally protectionism. So I think, to go back to your original question about what our first priority should be, I think that they're not, I don't think we're gonna see climate action in this administration, simply because it's not gonna succeed in the Senate. But I do think there's gonna be a major infrastructure program. Uh, Biden's talking about $2 trillion, but a piece of it is Buy American. And I think we've got to get down there, and this is not just the federal government, but the premiers in particular have got to get down and talk to their governor's uh, equivalent and, and say, if we're going to do this, we as governors and premiers want to make those dollars go further. We're better to have some competition, so let's do a reciprocity procurement agreement. The Canada-US-Mexico agreement does not include a procurement agreement. We'd have to rely upon the WTO, and I, don't, I think we'd be far better to do what we did in the last big build effort, and that was as part of the Obama-Biden stimulus program, something Biden was in charge of, but it was administered at the state level. And what we, our premiers went down, led at the time by Jean Charest and Brad Wall, and uh, they negotiated with their American governor counterparts, because we couldn't do it at the federal level, a reciprocity procurement agreement, which allowed us to bid on their projects and then to build on ours, and that will work to our advantage. And I would make the same point on the Keystone. I wouldn't lead with Keystone. Um, I think Keystone has become, as Monica says, an emotional symbol. And when emotion's involved, it's very hard to combat it with facts, even if the facts do favor what we have to say. I think James Rajat, who's the Alberta rep, will be down there. Premier Kenny will be down there making this. This should now be a U.S. debate. I wouldn't make it a Canada-U.S. issue, and I certainly wouldn't do what we did with the, during the Harper administration and make it the litmus test of the relationship because the relationship is far bigger, far deeper, and more important than simply monthly a pipeline. Um, we've got other things at stake, including uh, in the big infrastructure projects of which we can get a piece. Frank, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to add a, a you know, kind of a more, some 60,000 feet up in terms of how the citizenry might be quite different as we emerge from the current uh, political chaos, but also from the pandemic. And I think the assumption that there's gonna be some return to the status quo could be a badly flawed assumption. In most of the work we've been looking at, both in Canada and in other countries, their citizens are saying they want to, they see this as being as on the cusp of a transformation. That a lot of things have been laid bare by the pandemic that will provide both opportunities, but for a different balancing of society and the economy, which certainly would include things like climate and energy. But I, I feel as well that we've seen certain things uh, revealed in which are going to affect the kinds of policies that will be constructed. And even thinking about USMCA, the, which, uh, which is it's seen as, you know, a, 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 as something, thank God we've got that sign in Canada. But I believe that some of the dormant ideas around, for example, a more integrated North America might in fact be ideas which can come back into focus as bigger ideas, because I know in the past we pulled in all three countries and found that there was a lot of enthusiasm for the idea, of not having a, a currency union, but a, a North American integrated model where we would do energy, environment, security, in a way, even ideas of perimeter, which have always been replaced by ideas of walls, but those ideas could become available again. I also want to point out that we have seen huge impacts on public outlook on things like borders, but also on China. We found that in Canada, the 38% said that China was our most new market developed. When I asked it last time, it was 3%. I think there's probably similar changes going on in the United States. So you've got these geopolitical tensions. You've got the fragility of global supply chains been laid uh, bare uh, uh, by this. People want to start reconstructing domestic sort of made in Canada, made in United States, but you know, it's possible to position the idea of a made in North America, which could be a true juggernaut, and with this geo back backdrop of geopolitical tensions and concerns about China and so forth. Remember, Mexico is touted to be the fifth biggest economy in the world by 2050, Canada's the seventh, the United States will probably still be number one. The opportunities for uh, deeper integration, uh, while maintaining sovereignty, of course, I think is something that might come back into focus and would be a really exciting opportunity to build on you know, the success of USMCA, for example. A North American energy uh, integrated uh, 
model would be great. We can't seem to get one in Canada, so we might have to <laughs> solve, <laughs> solve our own issues domestically before we look beyond uh, <laughs> over to other countries. A question from the from one of our attendees: If the U.S. continues its isolationist stance, particularly if uh, Trump does squeak out a win, what do you foresee happening in terms of international relations, particularly with both China and Russia becoming? Uh, increasingly influential and obviously looking to exploit the vacuum on the international stage. I think I'll start with Chris and move on from there. Yeah, th this is another interesting area and I think it's an area where you'll see continuity. We always say there's co more continuity between administrations than first appears, like the style changes, the face changes, but, but U.S. foreign policy is often much more consistent between administrations. Um, you think about Jimmy Carter's defense buildup becoming Reagan's defense buildup, for example, uh, that, that kind of thing. Here, I think that there is a uh, kind of coming together of millennial interest and baby boomer fatigue, or I guess the rest of society fatigue, with the kind of wars that the U.S. found themselves drawn into after 9-11. And whether it was Iraq or it was Afghanistan, uh, to some extent in the Balkans under, under uh, Bill Clinton, um, and also, of course, Syria more recently, these wars don't have, have not had great victory marches. They don't end cleanly, and they often become nation building exercises. And if you're a young man or woman of age to be in the military, uh, this, is, this, this is a kind of war that's just no win. Uh, it's, it's tragic, it's expensive, and it doesn't lead to any great thing. What Trump, uh, President Trump has done by shifting his focus, and you see this in the US national security strategy, to China and Russia as near peer competitors, and I'd say China is a lot closer to being a peer in terms of capabilities than the Soviet Union ever was, but that focus puts an emphasis on deterrence. You build up a big military capability, you play the technology jump ahead game, but you try to create, um, you try to create a deterrent against an actual war. It's not cheap, but I think that really resonates well across the generations. It doesn't, it may be expensive, but it doesn't lead to a lot of um, funerals for young American servicemen and women. So um, that has a lot of appeal and Americans are very security conscious. The risk is always that we push the confrontation with China too far. Um, but I think in general, uh, the quad linking Australia, India, Japan, and the United States and the Pacific is, is a very promising sort of proto uh, type of, of future Pacific NATO. Um, and it will be really important for Canada in that regard, both to think about how it plays in that game, but also its, its defense posture. Canada is really well positioned for European wars, much of its capabilities aimed at the East and at NATO. It's not well positioned for a Pacific conflict, um, but maybe that's okay. Maybe Australia is the Commonwealth partner for the US in Asia Pacific and Canada helps on the margins, but is much more a participant in the European theater, which after all is where the Russians are. So, so I think in a lot of ways, this is going to be something that endures. You don't see huge differences between Republicans and Democrats on this, even of the older generation. And I think it has a lot of appeal going forward. Not to say that it doesn't have complications for Canada. Yeah, so I'd be curious to hear what Colin has to say on that because this, you know, the isolationism seemed to take another step forward under President Trump. And so I guess the question is, how do we, how do, what does Canada do in that context going forward? Sure. Well, remember, he campaigned on America first and in his inaugural speech talked about that America was taken advantage of in multilateralism. That's Donald Trump. Uh, Joe Biden is very different. When I met him, he was chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and our discussion was about multilateralism. And he, Biden has said, and the people around him have said, that he is an internationalist and a multilateralist. And I think he's made it clear, as we've talked earlier, he wants to come back into the Paris Climate Accord, but he's also been very uh, strong in support of NATO, something that Trump said, well, if you don't pay your way, I'm not going to help you, and maybe we should pull out anyway. So I think we do see a big change at least from the president, in terms of his endorsement of the uh, rules-based multilateral organizations, but particularly collective defense. I think that Biden personally cares about this and, uh, and that, but it is gonna put some pressure on us because I do think whether it's a Republican president, as it was with Mr. Trump, who wanted us to pay more, or Barack Obama, who came to Canada for the Three Amigos and went to parliament and said, you know, 
NATO needs more Canada, not once, not twice, but three times. The message he was delivering gently was that we've got to do more in defense. And I think that will not change under Biden, especially as, as has been pointed out, and as you started off about the rise of uh, rising China and revanchist Russia. And for us, it's going to come down to the North warning system uh, and sovereignty in the Arctic. And the Americans are going to push us to invest more. And that's going to be hugely expensive. But it's uh, something we haven't invested in for about 30 years. And, and that is coming at us. And I think it's going to come at us whether it was a Republican president or now with Joe Biden, he will be pushing us to make more investments in defense and asking us to raise our defense spending to 2% of GDP, which is sort of the NATO standard. Other countries are now reaching it. Certainly the Brits are there, the Germans are approaching it, French moving up. Um, certainly most of the Eastern Europeans are there. So we're gonna be under pressure and I think we should get ahead of it and probably do that investment so it serves our interests, which probably is in the North. So there's a question that's come in for, for Chris. It's about the prospects for Canada-U.S. coordination on carbon border adjustments with respect to the rest of the world, along with some coordination on our domestic carbon tax. And Chris, you can start, but maybe Monica's going to jump in as well. well. I'll have to admit, I think this is, a, this is right in Monica's uh, wheelhouse, so she'll give a better answer. I, I think there's always been a, a, a question of whether... Um, these kind of taxes could be synchronized or whether we're going to have an era of green protectionism. And uh, it, there's a, there are risks going both ways. Um, I wouldn't put it past the United States to start worrying that because it's late to carbon pricing in, in most jurisdictions, that it's going to need to have an equalizer. Uh, and Canada's well positioned. You already have a carbon price, but other countries not so. So uh, I, th I think there'll be a lot of appeal in the us versus them politics of the moment because it sort of pulls Americans together to do things that aim at other countries. But my own sense is that Canada, under a Biden administration that wants to move in a broadly similar direction will have the upper hand. If Trump were to somehow hash this out, he would see Canada going the wrong direction and it might be in a bad position. But I think Canada is definitely in line with where many in the U.S. want to go. But Monica, as I say, is, is brilliant at this, so I'll defer to her. And Monica, yeah, and before you answer that, I think, you know, when you look at the way the Canadian energy companies have actually committed to ESG metrics and talk about, talked about net zero and moving in that direction, um, how does that, you know, in the context of this question as well, does that give us a different positioning going I, forward? Yeah, I think all of this is extremely uh, important. And it makes me think of, you know, former, uh, the late ambassador, Alan Gottlieb, who said, you know, Canada is just another special interest in the United States and not a very special one uh, at that. You know, and, and if you think back to my initial comment around uh, 2000s, in the 2000s, energy security was an issue. So the U.S. was really looking to Canada for energy. I think that's changed now. So we have to, I think we need to change the narrative a bit in terms of, you know, not to be too crass about this, but what is it that we bring to the table? What does our energy bring uh, to the table? And so there's where, you know, maybe framing things in such a way where it is, whether it's touching on issues of security, because certainly, you know, you can be isolationist as a country, but if you look at North American electricity, for example, we've got one of the largest, if not the largest electricity markets in the world that's highly interdependent, interconnected. Reliability is there because of that interconnected grid. And so I think it's about thinking through what is the value to the United States of an interconnected and interdependent energy system in North America, in North America and that's oil, gas, electricity. And, you know, putting it in, in, in a framing that actually sees some real benefit for the U.S. And I think looking at issues like security, looking at issues like performance on, uh, on climate, Deborah, to your point about, uh, about ESG, looking at a variety of different factors where we're actually better together vis-a-vis -vis other sources uh, of, of energy internationally. Uh, there's a question that's come in, and I think everybody's got it. We'll have a, a, a view on this and something to offer. Can anyone on the panel specifically address issues of race inequality in America and how it will be addressed in our potential Biden presidency? Uh, whoever wants to start, I will uh, just I will let them go ahead. Well, I. I, I... Deborah, I think this is one of those questions in which fools rush in um, because it's obviously I'm I'm not uh, I'm not African American I, I can't really speak for the community, I, but I think that there's something that has happened in American politics which is a conflation of two things: frustration with police brutality and systemic inequalities and prejudices that have have really come to a boiling point with African Americans, 
and at the same time, a sense of frustration that's turned into uh, violence and rioting. And the mix is very toxic. It's very tough for anybody to know which way to go. My suspicion is that particularly because Democrats have deeper roots with African Americans who have traditionally supported them, the challenge for the Biden administration will be, can they split those two off? Take a strong stand against violence, which upsets people in the suburbs, which actually hurts a lot of African American small business people, etc. While at the same time offering hope that a more constructive dialogue and actually a Washington D.C. that's prepared to listen on issues of police brutality and and so forth uh, is going to be there for them as an alternative. It's it's a needle that has to be thread, but for the future of the country, I think it's a really important one, and I think Joe Biden partly because he served with Barack Obama uh, as his vice president, uh, partly because he's been working these issues for a long time. I think he's probably better positioned than Trump would ever be to have that conversation with the country. So I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that it happens. Who'd like to take that on next? Frank, Colin, Monica? Sure. Um, my sense is that I can, the comparison of how these issues play out in say Canada, the United States is, uh, Quite different, but there are some areas of similarity which I suspect uh, will will exert themselves as political influences going forward. The the, um, the the those who tell us that issues around racial inequality, uh, not just black white, but obviously in Canada, Indigenous, and other areas in the United States, also Latino, those issues have, have reached at the highest levels of concern that we've seen in polling in literally 30 years after being somewhat dormant for a while. So the Black Lives Movement and other or forces, perhaps coalescing with the influences of the pandemic, which have laid further bare some of these differences, uh, which exist in terms of, you know, who's suffering most both economically and from the health consequences of the crisis. Uh, these things I think are, um, have reached, not a fever pitch, but, but something which is going to be very, very difficult to ignore. So I expect that those will be relatively salient issues on the, uh, on, on the agenda going forward. And again, I'm not to, to belabor it, but when you look at the and parse things, recognizing generations are important, but if you look at the generational experiences of those who come from these particular racial backgrounds, they're profoundly different than those who uh, are experienced, although there obviously is a, a, a black middle class as well, but I think when, when I look in data and compare uh, ge generations, I find, yeah, there are generational effects and some of them are quite profound, but they actually are eclipsed by the importance of the social class drivers, which are very much intimately connected to race. And they, those produce very, very different outlooks. For example, I just want to throw out the idea that as we climb out of this uh, uh, pandemic and its economic carnage that it's produced, what we're seeing emerge in the United States and, and in possibly in Canada as well, is this specter of a K-shaped recovery. We're having uh, those who are of, and education is such a critical driver. And if you went back and predicted the uh, American election, I don't think anything would be stronger than the role of education. But those who are coming from the, um, uh, the non-college educated uh, high school levels are finding, uh, which is very much connected to race and, and class, are finding um, uh, that their ability to recover from this pandemic economically is much, much grimmer, and that possibly will get even worse going forward. So again, connecting that back to the issues of polarization, I think this becomes an absolutely critical challenge to figure out, and it's not gonna be a matter of just tinkering, it's gonna be a matter of some really profound policy changes in order to address this, this, this incredible challenge. Colin, would you like to add to that or? Well, I'll, I'll just say we've been at civil rights now for nearly 60 years and, you know, there has been progress, but not enough, clearly. And I, I think that we're, we're moving into a period now where there's not going to be a lot of money. You know, the, the, the bills from the pandemic and the debt that the U.S. has incurred is extraordinary. No other country could carry that. We couldn't carry that. And so that the, the, the room for new programs that come with a price tag there's not a lot there, so I'm, um, I'm, uh, I, 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 I think this is going to. I think there's going to be. Uh, there's certainly very high expectations, but I'm not sure that they are going to. There's not going to be a lot of disappointment and frustration 
first because the lack of, of dollars and secondly because in terms of regulation and legislative authorities things like affirmative action we've tried a lot of things and it's uh, it has not succeeded the way that the uh, authors of this legislation have hoped it would so Frank, if I read you correctly, what you said was, uh, you know, education is going to be a very big uh, determinant in terms of who who actually comes through this pandemic and the recession uh, better than, than, than others. And the way this plays out will contribute to further polarization. Does this sort of set up for a sort of a national strategy on education that looks like a GI Bill. And I'm wondering, I mean, it's one thing, the state, the U.S. is one place where this can happen, but what about Canada? Well, yes, and, and it is, but I think the idea that, you know, human capital and investments in higher education would produce, you know, a shared prosperity involvement, everybody moving forward. Uh, guys like Robert Reich, who, uh, you know, championed that with his idea of a symbolic analyst in the late 90s, in the Clinton administration has now sort of retreated and said, that's really not the answer. It's a fact possibly just made things worse. And so what, that's why we're seeing, for example, in the, in the United States even, support for uh, you know, socialism obviously has always been the third rail of American politics. Although we found, for example, that things like Warren's proposal, uh, proposal for a wealth tax was supported by 65% uh, of Americans. In Canada, that was 75%. And it's risen to 85%. What's interesting is that ideas like wealth tax, universal, universal basic income, you know, uh, ideas that would have been unthinkable may in fact come into closer focus now and, and be more, more realistic prospects. Because, for example, Holland tried that in France. It didn't work. There was all kinds of flight of capital. But, you know, the United States is going to go down some version of that route. Canada goes down some version of that route, and we see it occurring in Europe as well. And that specter really disappears. So some really big ideas. Uh, might become possible in the aftermath of this. And remember that there are moments where there are sort of once in a lifetime types of transform transformations that go on. The last time we saw one really was coming out of the Great Depression, where if you look at the range of policy responses that emerged from actually what was a populism of a different brand back then from the Roosevelt's, there was a creation of a, a, a minimum wage, importing a social safety net from Bismarck and Germany, the creation of public high schools, uh, Bretton Woods Convention, massive public works, these things ushered in an era of shared prosperity, which went on for uh, 50 years and has been unmatched. Maybe, you know, not to be much, to be a little more optimistic on what's been a fairly gloomy set of comments so far, the possibility that those kinds of this accelerants could allow us to achieve that kind of a transformation, maybe of a very different type. But yes, yes, issues like education, human capital, but also income disparity, then particularly the hyper-concentration of wealth at the top was a relatively stagnant economy. Remember, upper North American economies now have grown in this century on an average rate when certain would factor in this latest uh, disaster of probably 1%, maybe 2%. That's a pale echo of what was going on in those era of shared prosperity when they were going at 6 and 7%. Anyway, so I think the, that, that may be a time for some big thinking on some of these. Certainly, that's where the citizens are. Martha. Yeah, no, I just want to add, I see in the question uh, note here that somebody says it would have been fantastic to have some uh, uh, black, indigenous and people of color representation on, on the panel. So, you know, I do wade in uh, uh, and I am cognizant that, you know, that we are an all white panel, which uh, is increasingly uh, <laughs> a, a challenge. I also would just note, you know, it's I think it's not just about um, transforming policies and you know throwing money at things i think it's also about transforming the way we think about these issues you know i come from a campus for those who aren't familiar with this at the university of ottawa we have just had a very raucous and are still in the midst of that uh controversy around uh the use of the n-word uh in a, in a classroom and it's uh, i can tell you it's divided the campus uh it's created lots of challenges it's found its way into quebec politics up the way to the level of the pre Premier. It's been in the House of Commons. I mean, so to think in Canada that, that we're immune from these uh, from these challenges is 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 you know uh, pr probably uh, misguided. And uh, we're really going to have to change how we do things uh, going forward. So I just wanted to give uh, a shout out to the person that that noted that in the comments section. And well, with that, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who took the time to listen to us online. 
and to all of you for your insight on what we continue to watch going on south of the border and to Chris, who's living it in real time met in Washington, D.C. Um, so thank you so much. Our next event is going to be on the 18th of, of November again. Uh, deconstructing the outcome of the of the U.S. election. I, I hope that you'll be able to join the School of Public Policy on that next event, and I'm sure we'll be seeing a, an email into your mailboxes shortly about that with more details. Thanks again, and good luck watching the returns as they continue to be tallied. Bye for now.